episode one of The Gold Mafia. We love the gangster lifestyle. You live by the gun, you die by the gun. The biggest challenge Zimbabwe now faces is the gold mafia. Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates the rival gangs that control Africa's gold. As long as you grease the wheels in Africa, there's no issue. It's fine, That's all it is, fine. All the paper trails, it's not like somebody can question on it. Former members of the gold mafia speak exclusively to the I unit. The gold mafia is bigger than the government bigger than any of the authorities. What do you think is going to happen? They kill you, don't they? Exactly. Undercover journalists pose as gangsters who want to launder more than 100 million US dollars. It's blood money. This yeah. funds are substantial. The I unit obtains thousands of confidential documents that expose how organized crime groups use gold to launder money. You sold it to a refinery and the money got paid in the bank account. So it's very okay. clean that way. Once it's refined, it's practically brand new gold. Good washing machine, right? The money to be printed. Yes, yes. Not in the books in uh, Hong Kong or China. It is blood money. This yeah. funds are substantial. Is it 100 million? Is it 50 million? Is it 10 million? Is it 20 million? Is it what it's more, more than 100? Okay. Kamlesh Patney is one of Africa's most notorious gold dealers. He calls himself Brother Paul after founding his own church. We try to move our money to find investment overseas. Mr. Stanley leads the I unit's undercover team. They're posing as gangsters who need to launder dirty cash from China. It's very so, important so, to get the right person. Yeah. As a so, starting point. Fix right? it, yeah. But I'm going to give it to you in a very crude way. As way of explanation, they're looking for a Hawala system. Yes. To get the money out. Yeah, sure. Johnny is posing as a black market trader, a Hawala man, who moves money across borders without using banks. And the Hawala system is based on trust. Trust and, and connections. Yes. But we need advice. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's structure. Yes, yeah. Yeah, sure. Can you invest in you? Yeah, if you're... Uh, because you have all the connections. Structure already. Yeah. No, if you have the trust. Patney claims to have the trust of Africa's leaders. Very <laughs> beautiful, yeah. This is the, the president, Mugabe. Oh, Mugabe. This is me. I got the award as Lifetime Africa Achievement Award. This is Uganda. This, oh, yeah, that's you. This is me. Patney was made a peace ambassador by the Kenyan Council of Elders. This is the president of Kenya, Kibaki. This is the king from Ivory Coast. This is the president of uh, South Africa, Deten Zuma. That is, of course, the AU Africa Union chairman, that time. You know him, the Libyan president, Gaddafi. Yes. He crowned the Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi, as the King of Kings of Africa. After Gaddafi was killed, the pastor anointed Zimbabwe's President Mugabe as the King of Kings. Mugabe was dethroned in a military coup in 2017. His successor is Emerson Manangagwa. Today, we are witnessing the beginning of a new and unfolding democracy for our country. President Mnangagwa is using a UN climate change conference to attract foreign investment. Zimbabwe is open for business. Oh, 
His presidential envoy is also at the conference and agrees to meet undercover reporters. Zimbabwe is like really open for business when we say these things. Okay. He says he has the president's authority to make a deal with Mr. Stanley. The name is plenipotentiary. Plenty simply means full potential, means power, so full power. That means I can sign contracts, I can sign treaties with government without the president getting involved. And then they will be fine. Ubert Angel is Zimbabwe's ambassador at large to Europe and the Americas. He's part of what we call the diplomatic mafia. He's also a self-proclaimed prophet. Angel leads the Good News Church, which has 15 branches around the world. Woman with a trip niff. He appears to heal the sick. Yeah. It takes the power of God, but it takes somebody to believe for something to happen like this. His prophecies include football scores from the English Premier League. When it comes to football matches, I'm on TV, live TV, talking about it's going to be two, uh, this one is going to score, this one is not going to score, and it's live around the world. Before a match plays, we'll tell you if it's draw. Today is what? West Ham versus Leicester City, right? I'm just hearing. Both teams scored 2-2. Just as Prophet Angel prophesied. Powered by the Holy Spirit, Hubert Angel. We have the man of God working with us. President Menangagwa appointed Angel to one of the country's highest diplomatic posts. He is my first ambassador at large assigned to promote Zimbabwe brand. We had to subject this young man to training in diplomas. It's difficult to train a prophet. We were surprised that he did well. <laughs> I'm ambassador at large, I'm ambassador to 85 countries, but on the special envoy, I'm a representative of the president. You are representing the president. Yeah. So if you then look on paper, on that position, I'm number two. And there's no position like that in the country. It was just one position that was never filled in. And it's created by... for you. Yeah, it was created. <laughs> so one and only one. <laughs> one. <laughs> Miss Sin is another undercover reporter. She's posing as Mr. Stanley's financial advisor. We are the government. Yeah. <laughs> so I can call the president now, not tomorrow, now, and put him on speaker. It's not an issue. The president is trying to create a legacy right now. Yeah. So it is the right time to strike now. Yeah. And we're like, we're in. Angel claims to foretell the destiny of Africa's leaders. Four days before the Ghana presidential elections, Prophet Hubert Angel gave the word of the Lord, declaring the outcome. No, it's not the rejection of Muhammad. But he that is called Adonana shall remain in power. And you want to know what will happen in the election in Zimbabwe? How many times have I spoken about it? All I'm saying is don't... Manangagwa's win in 2018 is known in advance. There's no point supporting the opposition. Don't waste your time wearing all these t-shirts and regalia and meeting people at these conferences and these meetings. Just concentrate on Jesus, eh? You waste your time. Manangagwa will also win Zimbabwe's next election. The deal to launder Mr. Stanley's money is safe. OK, let me just say, don't worry. You yeah. the president. <laughs> this president will be president until he dies. I was born in Africa, I was born in Kenya. And I've been to nearly 80% of Africa. Kamlesh Pantney's rise to become a fixer for Africa's leaders begins in his homeland. We had embargo on the country in 89, 90. It was dictatorship that time. Mm. It was single party. President Moy 
Arup Moy. Daniel Arup Moy refuses to hold free elections. In protest, Western donors block aid. Patney then has a chance encounter. I was just 24 years old. I was buying a suit in Nairobi and I met the director of intelligence. Uh, then I told him about gold. I said, look, there's so much gold flowing through Kenya, but it's nothing Kenya is benefiting. It's not yeah. Patney tells the intelligence chief he has a solution. I said, I can create the 500 million, you know, every year from this if you do a proper license of, of this gold. So he took me to president. Said, yeah, oh. Wow. So I, I, I became advisor to the president, President Moy. So then he gave, uh, you know, exclusivity. Patney's company, Goldenberg International, is granted an exclusive license to export Kenyan gold. Instead, gold from what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo is smuggled into Kenya. He sells it abroad and receives a 35% commission from the government. In total, Patney pockets $600 million. It's shared with Arab Moy and the government officials who gave him the license. Kamlesh Patni is a criminal mastermind, is the only word to describe him. He managed to implement a gold, illicit gold money laundering scheme, which nearly took away over 10% of the Kenyan GDP in value. It's, it's, it's a, it's, I've written books on that. I'll give you the book. Yeah, yeah, I've written on how uh, democracy should work. Mm. But uh, of course, in 92, there was a lot of fights, riots in the street, and they wanted multi-party. Patney has advice for Arab Moy. His money will buy support for the president and weaken the opposition. Just make it multi-party. Because if the money is with you, you'll still win. But just for the show. I help the president to survive. Arab Moy retires after 24 years as president. Opposition came in, then they discovered me. They said, who is this young person who kept the president in power and win the election? Then they fought me. Patney appears in court, charged with fraud. At one point, he seems to be ill. Years later, the trial collapses, and he's never convicted. You're a thief. This guy's a thief. He stole billions of taxpayers' cash. Shame on you. Get him to he stole billions, and he put away. Huh? Between a past and upper. You're a thief. This is just going to enrage me. I know this. The Kenyan courts went after him for nearly 13 years. He was acquitted of all charges scot-free. He moved to Zimbabwe to reinvent himself, found new religion, started his own church. Glory be to God. I'm the one who now again changed Zimbabwe. Today the country is where it is because of the, the, the efforts we put in. Otherwise the currency would be useless. In 2008, hyperinflation ravages Zimbabwe's economy. The central bank prints notes valuing billions in local currency. Zimbabwe's financial collapse follows sanctions imposed by the United States and Europe. No. No, we're not big, we're... The West punishes Zimbabwe's leaders for rigging elections and imprisoning opposition politicians. We believe that Zimbabwe should not be a part of the international financial system. That means that they can't transact in dollars, so you have to figure out other ways to do that. And the way to do that is to turn your currency, for example, into gold. Because then you can move across the border with gold, and it's not hitting the international financial system 
at that point in Zimbabwe. With gold, you can just shape shift. You can move the gold without someone tracking it. So for a lot of autocratic governments, it is, I think, a trend that makes sense. It's much harder to enforce sanctions around it. Patney makes deals with Zimbabwe's sanctioned leaders, which he claims help its people. Right now, they are, they are quite, uh, you know, stable, they're happy, they are uh, recovering well. Although they still, uh, you know, as usual, the, <clears throat> the influences are there. But uh, the, 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 the good thing is that the president listens. I'm number two in gold. Who's the number one? It's an Indian guy. Indian it's an Indian guy. guy. Yeah. Past the poor. He's just a thief. He almost put Kenya into liquidation. That's how big he is. Patney's rival is Ewan McMillan. He's a gold trader and smuggler, known as Mr. Gold. Mm -hmm. My family owned this business we have. So it was me, I owned it 100%. Okay. But then I gave shares to my two brothers. I went to jail first time for gold when I was 21. And then I went to do a lot of prison in the 90s. Zimbabwe's gold exports are worth up to $2 billion a year. It's a cash business. There's a lot of cash that we need to get out of Hong Kong and Macau because we don't want to leave it there. None of there is an opportunity, a hell of a big opportunity to wash money here. You can wash That's money That's what we are looking for. You want US dollars in a bank account, which would be better to have a bank account in Dubai, US dollars. So then the best thing is to meet my partner from Dubai. And he knows how we do things here. And then he can help you with how you can bring the money here, no problem. I can give my partner gold in Dubai and he can just pay you anywhere in the world. So I need him to come up with a plan of how to wash the money. And he's clever. He washes money for the Russians. Mr. Gold's partner in Dubai is Alistair Mathias. Alistair. Young, young guy. Huh? Mathias is also a gold trader. He's a financial architect who builds money laundering schemes for corrupt politicians. Thank you for coming. No, no, no. Has a seat. This is my partner from Dubai. Yeah, Ewan was saying you helped the Russians. Yes. Don't no, tell him, shut up. <laughs> we want to make sure that the mechanism works. Okay. I've been doing it for about like almost 13 years now, 14 years. Matthias offers to launder Mr. Stanley's money through his gold trading network across Africa. Ghana, I do one time, so I do $40 million every month out of Ghana. This, this region, I do what? Probably like about 500 to a ton again. Yeah. So I do roughly about $70, $80 million every month. Mm. So we can export from Zambia, I can export from South Africa. We have a company in Zambia, Angola, uh, Mozambique. We can export from anyway. We're in Zimbabwe, we're in Malawi, we're in Zambia. We're in DRC Congo, we're in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Patney is also based in Dubai. Dubai is a headquarter. Dubai is the center for Africa. A banking center, financial center, it's tax-free. You don't need to have all the pepper, mm. you know, too much. Easier to do yes. things. It's much easier. We, we have our own uh, uh, license clearing at the at Dubai abroad. We have permission of the Central Bank of Dubai. We have permission of Reserve Bank. We have, we have the money laundering clearance certificates. Brilliant. We'll show you all that. We'll show you. That's, that's what that's you what need. All the paper yeah. already. So, no, no, we'll show you that. So it's yeah. smooth. Because I think you have so many structures already, mm -hmm. we can just you you. join it. So this one is the main... Come via Dubai. So you can see our Dubai operation. That's where you'll understand the gold more. Mm. The one you want to do cash. <laughs> when you see it physically, you see the process, then you'll understand the security of it. 
is just a... Come and see my uh, operations and my team in Dubai. Not every day have uh, coming. <laughs> Thinker. Good, good. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank I you hope to see you again. Yeah. God bless you. Okay, thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise us. Praise God. Bloody Kenyan. I don't know how, but him and I, we're the same. I do 200 kilos a week. That's what we do, buy and sell. Macmillan and his rival gold dealer, Patney, work for the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, the country's central bank. There's a gold act in Zimbabwe, which makes the central bank the overseer and control and official dealer of gold in Zimbabwe. The central bank was given that mandate because traditionally all currency has always been backed by the bullion. Small scale miners produce half of the country's gold. But Zimbabwe's central bank doesn't have enough money to buy gold from them. I think that 80% of the gold mined in Zimbabwe gets smuggled out. They said to me, go out and get all the gold that's being smuggled out the country. Patnia McMillan buy the gold on behalf of the central bank. When a person comes to sell me gold, I don't have to write his name down. I don't have to do anything. I just take his gold, pay him. Please, I deliver to the government. The government asks me no question. We do 20 to 50 million a week. This one is a 3 million. The gold is delivered to a company owned by Zimbabwe's Reserve Bank. Fidelity Printers and Refiners Private Limited incorporates security and commercial printing, gold refining, buying operations and a mission to provide printing solutions and gold products to satisfy diverse stakeholder needs. Fidelity printers and refiners. So the printing aspect is obvious. They print government material. Their big uh, service is the gold refiner. In return for their services, Patney and Macmillan are given licenses to sell the gold abroad. Like the license. See, like this is two million. We have an account with Fidelity. The competing mafias fly the gold to Dubai and sell it there. They bring the proceeds back to Zimbabwe in US dollars cash. The government needs US dollars because the local currency has no international value. The dollars buy more gold from the miners and fund further exports. The gold mafias use this scheme to launder money. They offer to help Mr. Stanley. What would normally happen is we'd, we'd bank the gold, get the US dollars and fly it home to Zimbabwe. Instead, Mr. Stanley is told to set up a gold trading company and bank account in Dubai. He can now get a license to import gold into the United Arab Emirates. You're going to tell the bank that we're going to be trading in commodities or gold. The money will come to that account all the time. They place clean money from the official sale of gold into Mr. Stanley's account. You show that it's imported legally. You can show that you sold it to a refinery and the money got paid in the bank account. It's very clean that way. And now you have access to that money. That's your money. And then you're going to give us the US, the US dollars cash from Hong Kong. We're going to come back with that. Mr. Stanley's dirty money will be given to the gold mafia's couriers to bring to Zimbabwe. At Harare Airport, the dirty cash is declared as the proceeds from the sale of gold. Once declared, it is clean. Everything appears legal with the right paperwork. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 One million? 
The proceeds of the gold export will, in effect, be counted twice, declared as clean in Zimbabwe and in Dubai. I bring back the cash. That's why I buy the gold again. And the money laundering cycle starts all over again. The only illegal thing is you giving me the US dollars out of Hong Kong. Mm. But they don't know that. Yeah, it's extremely sad. It's extremely sad. We've got world-class deposits of gold, but we have nothing to show for it, thanks to people like Mr. McMillan. The biggest challenge we Zimbabwe now faces is the existential threat that comes from this mafia, the gold mafia. Patney then offers another way to get Mr. Stanley's dirty cash from Hong Kong to Dubai. There are two ways of this. One is, uh, is, is a carry, yes. yes. or second is Hawala. Hawala is sort of a catch-all term for an informal way to move money outside of banking channels. That is, in its essence, Hawala. Hawala usually involves financiers with close family or personal ties who swap funds and keep track on ledgers. Uh, Hawala is an, an incredibly common uh, money transfer system, and it works very simply. Uh, you have somebody in country A, um, and they get money from a customer. Let's say you want to send a hundred dollars. In our case, Patney's Hong Kong agent would take Mr. Stanley's dirty $100 bill. They will mark it on their ledger as money received. They'll send a message to their counterpart saying, we receive this money, please pay out the same amount. Another member of Patney's Hawala operation in Dubai would pay Mr. Stanley $100. So $100 isn't actually physically sent, but on the other end, there's sort of a settlement of accounts done. The two Hawala agents balance their books over time as customers send money in both directions. On the one hand, it is a legitimate mean, sometimes the only mean for economic migrants to move money, but it can also be used as a way for criminals and criminal enterprises to d evade detection through the banking system. You want a gold? We can make the call right now and it's done with the okay. president of um, Miners Association right this minute. He's, yeah, let me just tell this. Let me just um, call off. Right? Henrietta Rushwear heads Zimbabwe's Miners Federation. She's also the president's niece. I've got my people here. Hey, shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Let's talk business. Let's talk business. We'll talk about our stories later. Let's talk business. You want to just get gold. The other deals that we normally do with the people, like the one we did in Dubai, where they also want to invest in gold and buy gold, maybe send a private jet, pick picks up gold every week. That's perfect. No, that's okay. Let's do it, bro. Oh, they're taking 100 kilos every week. Okay. Okay. But why, how many? They're, they're getting it at less 4% of the world. Yeah. Mr. Stanley is being offered to buy the gold at a 4% discount. They're saying it's very good price. I think you yeah. should have said less 3%. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You should have said less 3%. <laughs> it was a mistake in, in, the, in the language. <laughs> because that's, that's the 1%, percent my 1%. You have just blown my 1%. <laughs> Rushware's plan will clean $5 million a week on a revolving basis. It begins with a payment of $10 million in dirty cash into the government's refinery fidelity. They bring in 10 million for instance. 5 million will be put into fidelity for the duration of their relationship. They get gold with 5 million every week, they take it out. 
Bring another five million. This continues until all his cash is cleaned. Henrietta Rushwear's laundromat can wash even more of Mr. Stanley's dirty money. So instead of bringing 20 million, 10 million, the 22 million. Half the sum remains with Fidelity. Five million a week is laundered as before. And an additional five million dollars will be cleaned through one of Rishwaya's gold producers. Then they give the other five million to the producer, who can actually add on to their weekly parcel that they take out. Mr. Stanley can now launder $10 million a week. You can easily open an account for them under one of your many companies. We are the only sector in the country that is paid in foreign exchange on cash basis. All right. So when we finish, I'll call you again, then we, we talk. Hope you will be available. Who is available? If it's here, I'll make your disposal. Thank you, thank you, sis. The ambassador has a local partner in mind for Mr. Stanley. It's called Billion Group that I own. He's also part of Billion Group. So Billion Group is in Zimbabwe, operating in Zimbabwe, so that when you want a venture, you don't go for someone you don't know. Angel is in Glasgow with President Manangagwa for the UN Climate Change Conference. Angel offers Mr. Stanley a meeting with the president. We're working on um, your meeting with him. He's had a meeting right now, so yeah. we finish at around seven, eight, nine. To president, gotcha. Manangagwa claims that sanctions hinder Zimbabwe's commitments to a greener economy. The removal of the illegal sanctions imposed on my country will undoubtedly enhance the timely achievement of our commitments. Sanctions limit the ability of Zimbabwe's politicians and state entities to trade. This country has sanctions. So the country can't sell the gold anywhere in the world. So an individual can sell it because he doesn't have sanctions. Macmillan has family ties to another businessman involved in assisting the government to break sanctions. He bankrolls this whole country. He wants, he phones up the governor, the Reserve Bank governor. Hi, I want a meeting. Okay, fine, what time? Uh, be at 11, I'm coming 11, okay, fine. He owns one of South Africa's largest cigarette manufacturers. He has a brand named after him. Simon Rudland runs his own mafia through his company, Gold Leaf Tobacco. He's known as the boss. He's, he's massive. He is one mother, my friend. You have no idea how big he is. Rudland exports more gold than Macmillan and Patney and has a different deal with the government. He's connected to Zimbabwe's ruling elite. His business partners include a retired general, a former sanctioned energy minister, and Manangagwa's former minister of foreign affairs. An ex-minister of mines buys a company from Rutland for over $800,000. Simon Rutland, I know him 100%. He flew out the day before yesterday on a private charter. Moses Nango works for South African Airways at Harare Airport. He offers to help the I units undercover team to smuggle gold. I've been working at the airport for the last 23 years. I've been helping people to move gold. I've been helping people to move money. I've been helping people to you know, to move diamonds. Moses describes how Rudland and his gold leaf mafia break sanctions on behalf of the Reserve Bank. Simon Rudland has got a special deal. What they do is once if they get the gold, they get the escort 
all the way to the airport. They've got uh, three to five people taking this out of the country. They carry gold. They give him the gold. He has a contract to move from Fidelity to Dubai. They do rotations. At the times there are three people at, at one flight, depending on the volume. When they get by the security checkpoint, their bags are exempted to search. They go with Emirates from Zimbabwe. It's EK714, that's the flight they leave with from Harare to Dubai. They are normally traveling either business class or first class. Someone has got serious buyers in Dubai already. Somebody's going to be waiting with the money. The couriers exchange the bullion for cash and take the next flight back to Harare. The same flight they left with, that's the same flight that they, they come back with. EK713 when it's leaving Dubai. The couriers pass through immigration at Harare Airport. They're all white. There's um, Keith Patrick. Flight manifests show he makes the trip 13 times in two months. An I-Unit surveillance operation observes Rudland's couriers at work. Talmaj George Alexander is spotted in a Czech shirt. He flies to Dubai seven times in the same period. Terence Ian Keith is carrying a black briefcase. His name appears on flight manifests nine times in two months. Airport officials are waiting in Harare. Once is one. They greet Johannes Swan as he arrives. Johannes Swan Sr. and his son, Johannes Jr., appear on flight records a total of 10 times. Here's um, Peter Bowen. Peter Bowen travels 10 times during the same two-month period. The I-Unit obtains a Reserve Bank document authorising Peter Bowen to export over 66 kilos of gold from Zimbabwe to Dubai. The surveillance team follows him. Bowen lands in Dubai at 6.40 in the morning. He hands over the gold and waits in the airport lounge. Just three hours after he arrives, he's back on the plane. When they get here to Harare, they just come outside by the arrival exit, hand over the cash, get another consignment, got on, on the same flight, went back again. Rudland's couriers earn cash for Zimbabwe's leaders in breach of Western sanctions. Government says to him, I've got 400 kilos to move to Dubai. Then he exports the gold to Dubai and then brings the money back and gives it to Fidelity. The gold is sold to a Dubai company, Orlean Global Trading. Orlean is also part of Rudland's business empire. It receives millions of dollars from the accounts of Rudland's company, Gold Leaf Tobacco. The government broke here, so they don't have enough money to buy the gold. 
So he says, okay, don't worry, I'll lend you the money to buy the gold. Rutland finances the sanctions-busting operation by providing an advance payment to Fidelity. He gives Fidelity the money to buy the gold for him to export. Fidelity's debt with him is, at any one time, 200 million, 250 million. That is huge. I think we are losing about a billion US dollars in illegal gold exports, which is a euphemism for gold smuggling. I think we are losing about a billion US dollars and Simon Radland is at the center of that. Hello, hello. Undercover reporters meet one of Kamlesh Patney's couriers. He's a guy from Zimbabwe. He's the one who flies. Dmitro Bakamov travels regularly between Dubai and Harare. He's also a director of one of Patney's companies in Zimbabwe. Our surveillance team observes him at work in Harare Airport. We have to have a lot of documentation to, to, to be allowed to, to handle this. A letter from Fidelity to Dubai Customs names Dimitro and a relative of Patney as couriers. It authorizes his company, Susan General Trading, to carry $3 million cash a week into Zimbabwe. The Reserve Bank announces that Susan's jewelry and gold exports are the country's top US dollar earner. Susan has developed a network that gives it financial clout, generating 168 million US dollars in 2020. Susan's business is considered so valuable in generating hard cash for Zimbabwe that the government pays it a bonus worth 18% of its exports. But documents obtained by the I unit reveal that it's all part of Patney's latest gold scam. We track down one of his former accountants. He export jewelry and gold bar to Dubai or rest of the world. In the exchange, he has to bring foreign currency to Jim. On paper, he's bringing money to Jim. When Patney's couriers return to Harare from their Dubai trips, they declare their cash at the airport. Anyone bringing currency has to declare at the airport with the Form 47 that generally we call for blue form. Sometimes they're bringing some cash from there and they declare it, but amount is less. Sammy worked at one of Patney's businesses in Harare. We've concealed his identity. They're not declaring actual amount. They're bringing like 50,000, sometimes 100,000. But they declare as like 1 million and 2 million. One blue form records Patney himself bringing $1.2 million in cash. The money is the proceeds of jewellery sold in Dubai. But Patney doesn't bring $1.2 million back to Zimbabwe. They give bribe to the custom guy there. They tell them to stamp their blue form, put the amount there, that they are bringing 1.2 million. But actually, he did not bring uh, that 1.2 million amount. Raj records the actual amount returned by Patney in his ledgers. Instead of $1.2 million, he brings less than 100,000. We have to officially declare in the, at the airport. This is the airport declaration. He leaves the bulk of the money from the sale of gold in Dubai. Custom declaration. The flight number, you see, you can see that. Patney now has insufficient funds for the next round of gold buying. In order to keep his export license, he's required to buy gold from small-scale miners. 
Now he need uh, more money to buying gold in Harare. So he collect from market. Patney makes up the shortfall from the Hawala market. He collects cash from Zimbabwean clients who want to send US dollars to Dubai. He uses their money to buy the gold, which is exported and sold as before. Patney claims his 18% commission from the Zimbabwean government. In Dubai, he pays his Hawala clients with the proceeds of the gold sale. He collected that money, he got his commission, he paid them in Dubai. The much needed hard cash doesn't enter Zimbabwe's economy. With the gold export, Kamlesh Patni pretending that he's helping the country with the foreign reserve. He's not uh, bringing any foreign currency inside the country. He's taking all foreign reserve outside the country. So he's just making fool of with the people around him, the government officials. I'm not stupid. I have two degrees in finance. So I've done a lot, OK? I'm in the Forbes magazine. I've made the Forbes rich list of uh, 2013. Yes. Yeah, Africa Forbes rich list. Yeah. And remember, I'm also a minister of the gospel. Yeah. yeah. We will build the capital, the cash. Basically, we, we want the investment the money. Yeah. And sorry. Uh, what, what, what Mr. Stanley is saying is it's money that cannot be declared in the country of Orange. We've already discussed that we don't that we don't know we don't want to talk about but we have the blessing and it won't get us in trouble. <laughs> Trust me, I'm all right. I did this, okay? This is what this I happened. told you. And we got that. Okay. This is gonna be how much? At the beginning at least one million something. One billion. Yeah. Now we have done maybe for two hundred million. 300 million, but we have not done for 1 billion, they say. Angel and his assistant take Mr. Stanley aside. What are we doing? I'm just again glad like, he's diplomat in the country. Do you know I can carry me in a bag and nobody's allowed to touch this bag? I can carry me in a bag and nobody touches the bag. Right now I can I can finish the bag like this with 1.2 billion and put a red tape written diplomat. That's it. He'll use his diplomatic cover to fly Mr. Stanley's $1.2 billion into Zimbabwe. So it's a very, very easy thing. It will land in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe can't touch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until I get to my house. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you can understand. Okay. So you can be a diplomatic player.
In episode two of The Gold Mafia, Simon Rudland needs a money launderer. He's a billionaire. He's a billionaire. He controls 90% of this government. Then he finds one. He's held up as this shadowy figure that controls money laundering in South Africa. There was 50 million rand in cash in the houses, in suitcases. And Mr. Stanley's meeting with President Manangagwa comes at a price. Because his time is so valuable, the facilitation fee will be $200,000. 